ourselves to you every part of us, Lord. Father, we surrender every area, God. We lay everything down today. Any unsurrendered areas, I just, I feel like the Lord is saying, just lay it down. And align with him. Everything to his plumb line, amen? Everything in perfect alignment with him. So, Father, we just step in on your, your heavenly alignment, your, your heavenly yoke, the alignment of the kingdom of heaven today. And we say, here we are, Lord. Here we are. Father, we need this good spiritual breath of place in our hands, in our lives, Lord. Give us boldness and confidence in you, Lord.
love your presence, Jesus. We long after you like a dry and a thirsty land. We long after you, Lord. Come and quench our thirst. Come and satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts, Father. We don't want just a little touch, Father. We want you. Submerge us, Lord, in a downpour of your presence, Father. Increase your presence, Lord. Quicken us. Stir us. Quicken us, Father. Stir us, Lord. Father, stir us. Allow your presence to be like a wild fire within our hearts. Let our hearts boil over with love for you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. And it's all about your presence. Without your presence, Father, we just have a boring religious meeting. And we don't want to just sing songs. And we don't want to just talk. We want your presence. And you're already here. Continue to increase in these refuge gatherings month by month and year by year. Continue to stir us and quicken us. Come off the I-90. Travel into Palmyra. Turn aside into this great hotel. And come and be our honored guest. Come and abide. Come and rest. We don't want just a visitation. We want a habitation. We want to cultivate a manifest presence of the Lord that would transform and change lives. For those that attend these meetings and those that watch after, we pray that your manifest presence would come and stir them and quicken them in Jesus' name. Sweet Master, place your loving hand upon their hearts. Let their hearts burn from within at the sound of your voice. Father, I pray that I would lose my voice, that I would become the voice of another, the voice of one crying in New York. Father, I ask you that you would hide me behind your cross, that only you would be seen. I'm not here to showcase Steve, Father. Lord, let people be blinded to Steve and only see Jesus. Take hot coals of fire and place it upon my lips. Quicken my heart, Father. My dependency is upon you. And I promise you, Father, all the glory for what you will do in Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, sometimes I just have just fresh appreciation for the Lord. And I, I think sometimes we take it for granted. We take it for granted how precious the presence of the Lord is. The Lord is here this morning. He is with us this morning. And I tell Diane, I tell Stephanie quite a lot as well. The more I travel and the more places that I go, I'm thankful for those meetings because the presence of the Lord is in those meetings. But there's something so special about these refuge gatherings. And it makes me long to come back. I don't grow tired. 
We've gone far and wide, but yet I'm so thankful to be back home. Yeah. To me, this is home. Hallelujah. And it's like something that we're nurturing. Yeah. It's not just a meeting. Right. We're nurturing something. We're cultivating something. And I tell you, something is building month by month. I'm very encouraged this morning because I believe that Jesus, his presence is increasing. The worship is so sweet. I get comments Hallelujah. often. People will comment to me and they'll write me and they'll say that worship at the refuge gathering is so sweet. There's such a presence. We have people watching from Germany. We have people watching from England. We have people watching from Africa. Some people are tuning in more and more. Some people are making plans to actually travel to the United States just to come to this meeting in Palmyra. Yeah. And I don't say that in a bragging sense. I'm, I'm saying, look at Jesus. Man can't manufacture that. We can't manufacture the presence of the Lord. But when the Lord comes and abides and he rests, People's lives are changed forever. And so we are the best well-kept secret around. <laughs> but in 2022, it won't be a secret for much longer. Amen. We're just getting organized. Oh. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I have a message for you today. And I believe that this message will actually change and transform your life. And I don't say that lightly. In fact, I don't even like to use those words because it almost sounds like this message is going to change. We've heard that a million times before. But I'm serious when I say that if you will apply what I'm teaching you this morning, you will grow in the next six months what took you 10 years in the past. This will change your prayer life forever. And you'll think differently after today. There was a message that I gave several months back at a refuge gathering about ministering unto the Lord. And I told you about how that particular message will change your life forever. This is another one of those messages that I believe that will change your life. And it's the message of carrying his burden. Carrying his burden. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says... Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Hallelujah. I am so thankful for that verse. That at any moment, I can cast my cares on the Lord. So if I'm going through a season in my life that where I feel like there's this heaviness or my heart is broken for a situation, let's just say. I can immediately go to the Lord and say, Father, my heart is full. I'm feeling a burden. And the Lord never puts me off. He doesn't say, Steve, you know, I'm getting rather tired of listening to you. <laughs> the Lord doesn't say, you know, I got billions of people to keep track of. And you're just not on my radar screen right now. The Lord never says, I'm hearing a lot of this, and I want to hear this. The Lord, at any particular moment that I say, Father, Father says, I'm right here, Steve. He tenderly calls me, and he tenderly calls you by name. Every hair on your head is numbered. He dances a dance of rejoicing over the day that you were born. Hallelujah. He loves you with an everlasting love. And when you have a heavy heart, he says, I'm listening. When you feel like you can't take another step, he says, I'm here. Amen. He is the ultimate support system. Yes. Yes. And I don't know about you, but I tend to talk to the Lord a lot. Throughout my day, if I don't know how to, like earlier, we were having some technical difficulties, trying to get sound systems to work. We've had problems with the camera today. And so I'm talking to the Lord inside. I'm saying, Jesus, 
Can you help us with this? And I think that's the kind of relationship that the Lord wants us to have, where he's the first one that we call. Yeah. Sometimes we ring everybody else's phone but the Lord. We want somebody to listen. And sometimes when we go to certain people and we begin to talk about things, they're half listening. Or they're not very empathetic. They're like, oh, you know, just get over it. <laughs> or they give you the, oh, just trust the Lord, brother. <laughs> just, you, know, you, you're ready to like, your house is getting ready to burn down. And they're like, just trust the Lord, brother. <laughs> oh, bloody pretty, just trust the Lord. <laughs> But the Lord never does that. He's not like, oh, just trust me. He listens. I'm son, and he's concerned about what concerns me. And he never gets tired of me talking. I remember my wife telling me the story that when she was little, she lived in Texas. And she got behind a particular pulpit, and she was talking and, and pretending like she was speaking. And the pastor of that church told her about how God's going to use her mouth, that God's going to use her. And she told me that at certain times in her life that some people would, would tell her, you talk too much, like in school, you talk too much. And I've always felt like the Lord wanted to use my wife's mouth. He is a support to her. And some people get tired of hearing us talk. But the Lord never gets tired of hearing you talk. Right. He's never bored with you. And sometimes I like to pretend like I'm having an audience with a king. Because he is the king of kings. Sometimes I have matters or some things that are confusing to me that I'm facing. Or I have big questions that I need answers to. So I, I have an audience with my king. And I go to him and I say, Lord, I got to talk to you about a couple things. And I give him all the details. Sometimes with men, men want to hear the headlines, not the details. Some men have said, just the headlines. But the Lord's not like that. He doesn't think that. He's a father, but he also has a mother's heart, too. He's everything in one. He has the nurture of a mother, he has the wisdom of a father, and he Amen. never gets tired Amen. of hearing us talk. I said all of that to say this, at any second, we can go to the Lord with our burden, with our heart, and we can give it to Jesus, and he freely takes it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, you've heard this scripture verse a million times, but I'm going to give it to you today in a different light. You probably have never heard it this way before. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto death. Number one, that I may know him. I could give you a whole message on that right there, that I may know him, not just know about him. And the power of his resurrection. There's resurrection power in God. But the third part of this verse is the part that I want to focus on today. And the fellowship of his suffering. The fellowship of his suffering. When some people hear that verse, they think that the Lord is speaking only of the suffering that he went through on the cross. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus was whipped with the cat of nine tails. The crown of thorns went upon his head. But the fellowshipping with the Lord in his suffering goes far beyond Calvary. It goes much deeper. Jesus already died on the cross. And he was resurrected. So what is the fellowship of his suffering? Did you know that the Lord suffers in his heart? 
that the Lord in his heart can still feel pain. Once, in fact, I was just fresh out of Bible school, so it was the early 90s, and I still lived with my parents. I came home to my parents' home, where I grew up in, in Ohio, and I had a room, our bedroom, mine, which was off the basement, and it was very private down there, and I went into my bedroom, and I was my dad's assistant pastor and his youth pastor, his lawnmower and church cleaner, and I did all those different, different jobs, and I was preparing, I was excited about being in ministry, and I began to talk to the Lord, and suddenly I had a revelation. This revelation changed my life. This, res this revelation that I'm going to give you right now will change your life. It's going to change your prayer life. It's going to change you. Six months from now, you'll have 10 years worth of spiritual growth if you listen to what I'm about to tell you right here. It dawned on me in my room that I always, in prayer, casted my cares upon the Lord, which I needed to do, but I never once that I can remember up until that time ever asked the Lord what was on his heart. I always shared what was on my heart. But a true friend, if, if I want to be a true friend, then not only do I talk, but I allow the other person to talk too. Have you ever had a friend that dominates a conversation? Or they only shared what was going on in their life and their pain and their struggle and their drama. But when as soon as you tried to get one word in, they interrupted you and they went on with their thoughts and their burdens. And you were lucky to even get a breath in there. They dominated the conversation. Well, I realized something that I was dominating my prayer life. Yeah. That's good. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I want to be a true friend to you. Mm. I want to be like Abraham was the friend of God. Amen. David was a man after God's own heart. Moses knew him face to face and mouth to mouth. John the Beloved laid his ear upon the chest of the Lord Jesus Christ and could hear his very heartbeat. Could I get that close? Could I walk with the Lord like Enoch did in Genesis 5? If I truly wanted to be a friend to God, then it could not be a relationship based on only me. I should care about what he cares about. When he weeps, I should weep. What bothers him should bother me. Yeah. When he's grieved, I should grieve. Yeah. But the Lord's such a loving father, such a loving gentleman, that he just patiently waits to get a word in edgewise. And he, sometimes he waits an awful long time. Oh, yeah. Sometimes months, sometimes years, Sometimes decades. Can I be honest with you? Yes. There are some Christians that spend their entire Christian life only casting their cares on the Lord. Wow. They never enter that deep friendship. They never care enough to ask him, what is on your heart? What is bothering you? And so in my bedroom, I was sitting, and I said, Lord, what is on your heart right now? What is on your heart? And immediately, a burden. I have never felt such a burden before that. I felt it after, because I began an intercessory ministry after that. But before that, I've never felt that before that. I felt a burden, heavy burden. And the Lord spoke to me, I'll call it an inner audible voice. It was not audible, but it was so loud in my spirit. I had no doubt that it was Father speaking. 
And he said, Steve, he called me by name. He said, child pornography breaks my heart. Mm. Abortion breaks my heart. And child abuse is breaking my heart. Mm. Immediately, I burst into tears. I got down on my face on the carpet, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I sobbed, and I was broken, and I cried, and cried, and cried, and cried, and cried. I felt a burden, and I began to speak in tongues, and I began to intercede for the children around the world that were being abused, that were being killed and aborted, all of these things. And after I prayed, I can't even put a time limit on it. I don't know if it was a half hour or an hour or longer. I lost complete track of time. Suddenly, it lifted. The burden lifted. And the Lord said, you carried my burden. And you prayed clear through. In other words, I wrestled in prayer with something that was on the heart of God. I know that I'm just a human being and I'm very limited, extremely limited. And he's God, all powerful God. But I know that in, even in my limitedness, that if I even reach out to him and say, God, I care about what you're going on inside of your heart that it would so touch the heart of God because very few people will do that. Oh, I'm telling you this will change your life forever. I'm feeling a presence of the Lord stirring. This is the heart of God. This is the word of the Lord. If you will listen and if you will begin to pray that way and say, God, what is on your heart? You will begin to carry the burden of the Lord. After that, there were times that I would visit different churches. Sometimes in those services, I would feel great joy. And the Lord says, you're experiencing what I'm experiencing. I feel great joy. There were other times I would sit in the back. Nobody knew who I was, and I would feel so grieved that I couldn't sit there. No, I didn't have an attitude. No, I wasn't being critical. And no, I was not being judgmental. I did not go into that service with a preconceived idea to be critical. I did not have a critical spirit. But I felt grieved. I felt tormented in my spirit. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm knocking on the door and they will not let me in. They're happy and they're content with the way that they are. And I'm not allowed in. Oh, how I want to go in. Oh, how I want to visit my people. Oh, how I want to go in and love my people. How I want my presence to invade the four corners of the sanctuary. Oh, how I want to fill the spirits of the hungry and the lost, but I'm not permitted in. They're playing house of God. They're content with church as usual. They restrict my Holy Spirit. And I could feel that grieving. I was carrying his burden. And so I would pray from the back. Nobody knew my name. Lord, bring breakthrough. Lord, let people's hearts open. And sometimes there would be a breakthrough that would happen in that service where the Lord would begin to move. You could feel him coming into the service. There were other times that the grieving was just there, and I left feeling the grieving heart of God. My friends, we can fellowship with the Lord in his suffering. We can walk so close to the Lord that we begin to feel what burdens his heart. What's on the Lord's heart right now? Let me give you three things that I believe that are on the heart of God right now as we speak. Number one, the consequence of sin. The consequence 
of sin. In Luke chapter 13, verse 34, it says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So here's the Lord crying over a city. And he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He was not standing there going, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. You naughty little city. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not let me. When you study this, you realize that the Lord was crying, and he wasn't just crying normal, he was crying hard tears as he stood over a city that was full of sin. Why was he grieved? Because he knew that the wages of sin is death. He knew that if man would make the wrong choice, that the consequence, the wage of that wrong choice would bring the judgment of God. He knew that hard times were ahead for Jerusalem. Just like he knew that there were hard times coming to Samaria. He knew that there were hard times that came to certain cities in the Old and the New Testament. The judgment of God. He doesn't want to drop the judgment, but the judgment will come if man gets hard-hearted and they refuse to repent. Yeah. Right now, the Lord's saying, Oh, America, America. Yeah. There is. Oh, New York, New York. Mm -hmm. Oh, California, California. And he's walking the highways, the I-90, and he's walking through California, and he's walking through Massachusetts. He's walking through Connecticut. He's walking through Maine. He's walking through Hawaii, and he's longing to go and touch God's people. And his heart is burdened because there are a people that have hard hearts that refuse to listen to the word of the Lord. But yet there is also a remnant of people that God is raising up in New York, in Massachusetts. There is the bride of Christ that's in love with him. There's the bride of Christ that adores him, that's longing for his appearing, that's meeting with him in the garden of the Lord. And for those, that bride, that special bride, he says, oh, wise virgins. Oh, those that have oil in your lamp. You have touched my heart. You warm my heart. To think that we can touch the heart of God in that way. Yes, we can. We can touch his heart. And when the bride gets together and they long after him, when they come together in a refuge gathering and they long for the Lord, it touches his heart. And rather than feel grieved, rather than feel that grieving, he feels great joy. And sometimes we'll feel a celebration, we'll feel like dancing and laughing and jumping. We'll feel the fire of God that burns bright because that's what the Lord is experiencing. So fellowshipping with the Lord is fellowshipping with the Lord when he celebrates, but also when he's grieved. And that grieving is a suffering. Let me put it this way. We all have kids. You love your kids. Most of you would die for your children, would you not? You'd be willing to give your life for them. When your children make wise choices, it makes you very happy. When your children make poor choices, it grieves your heart. Because you know 
that that poor choice is going to lead to suffering. And sometimes our kids will listen, and sometimes they'll be stubborn and they won't listen to their parents because they know more. We all have been through that. In my 20s, I knew more. But sometimes we learn as we go. When you see your children make wrong choices, it grieves your heart, you cry tears, and you're suffering. Why are you suffering? Because you're mad at them? Not necessarily. You're suffering because you know that they've opened the door to pain in their life. That's the Lord. He suffers. That suffering is because he knows that the consequence for those actions are not good. That you're going to leave the garden of the Lord and you're going to enter the valley, the desert, because of the fact that you refuse to listen. But we can suffer with the Lord. And the suffering that we do with the Lord is wrestling in prayer for breakthrough. We pray until something shifts. We pray and we push until something changes. You carry his bleeding heart until you know you've prayed clear through and then you pray and you feel that peace and you realize that the Lord found someone, he found a true friend that not only received his ministry but also ministered unto the Lord. They carried his burden. So the consequence of sin is on the heart of God right now. Number two, there's an intense longing for his people. Oh, how the Lord longs for his bride. He longs for his church. He longs for people to listen. He longs for fellowship. He longs for those to enter the chambers of the Lord. He has tremendous love for his bride. And when we're going through something, he feels that compassion. Every time you cry a tear in pain, alone, the Lord also cries a tear. The shortest verse in the whole Bible is Jesus wept. He wept not because he was worried about Lazarus, he already knew that Lazarus was with the Lord, and he already knew he was going to resurrect him. He wept because he saw Mary and Martha hurt and wounded, and he loved them so. If you love someone, you don't want to see them hurt. When my wife goes through something and I know that she's wounded, I feel wounded because we're one. Well, we're one with the Lord. When he goes through something, I go through something. When I go through something, he goes through something. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's the love of God. Jesus wept over Lazarus because it affected Mary and Martha. And number three, what's on the heart of God right now is a desire for fellowship. A desire for fellowship. He wants to fellowship. He can't wait for you to get back into his inner chambers. He can't wait for you to return to the garden. You all remember the, the vision that I shared of Jesus in the garden. There's the bride sitting there waiting, and Jesus enters the gate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And she's just beaming because she can't wait to be with him. The truth of the matter is the Lord has been beaming. He was racing to get there. He loves it when his bride takes time aside, turns aside. Remember that message. Hallelujah. Turns aside and comes away with him. Come away with me, my love. He loves it when we come away, when we abide in him. Thank you, Jesus. How do we react when the burden of the Lord tries to manifest in our life? How do we react? 
Are we sleeping? You remember the scriptures, I was going to read them, but at the same time, the disciples were with Jesus in the garden. Remember? Jesus is sweating drops of blood because he's getting ready to get crucified. And Peter, James, and John were what? Sleeping. Sleeping. Could you not tarry? That's right, Barry. Could you not tarry one hour? Are we sleeping? Did you know that the burden of the Lord will come to you at inconvenient times? It was Walter Butler once that asked the Lord, Lord, why do you come so often during the night to me? And the Lord spoke to him and said, because there's so few that will answer the call. The Lord has lots and lots of children. You can't even count all of the children. But the Lord has very few friends. And out of his friends, he has very few that will listen. Let me put it this way. Jesus, while he walked the earth, had many disciples. And out of the disciples, he had the 12. Out of the 12, he had Peter, James, and John. That was his closest disciples. And out of the closest, he had John, the one that cared enough to put his ear against his chest. It's the same way today. There are many children, but very few friends. And out of those friends, very few of his friends are like John that want to get close enough to put their ear against his chest to hear his heartbeat, to know what's on his heart, tuning their ear to the heart of God. Hallelujah. Do we sleep when his heart is heavy or do we carry his burden? If I was to speak right now to, let's just say, 1,000 young men and women that are preparing for ministry, I would say, if you want to, you could be like everyone else, and you could seek after the Lord for an anointing. Lord, anoint me. Fast and pray for an anointing. When I went to Bible school, we all had to take turns to give a morning devotion. Every student had to get up there for five minutes and give a devotion in chapel. We had chapel every single day. And so I knew months and months in advance when my name was coming and when my date would be here. Months in advance. I had panic as a first-year student especially, panic. Because I knew, three months, I'm up. And every single morning in chapel, somebody new got up. And I said, that's going to be me in April. And so I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for an anointing. I can't tell you how many times I walked the floors and pray for an anointing at 19 years old. Lord, give me an anointing. When I get up there and I speak, let there be an anointing. And I sought the Lord for an anointing. When it was my time to speak, April finally came. I spoke and there was an anointing. I remember the piano player saying, I wanted to run up and get down on my knees. So I was thankful that the Lord honored all the prayers and the fasting. But then I also realized something. That I could spend my whole Christian walk with God just praying for an anointing. My whole relationship is me treating the Lord like a Santa Claus. Lord, give me an anointing. And then once the Lord gives you an anointing, then you go on autopilot. And you just kind of, because the gift are without repentance, the gifts will flow. He's not an Indian giver. And so you stop praying. And the Lord says, I'm looking for a bride that will enter a personal relationship with me. That will not just pray for an anointing. That will not just pray for the gifts. That will not just pray for me to do something for them. 
but they'll enter a relationship with me. And they'll fellowship with me in my sufferings. And they'll carry my heart. I'm looking for somebody that will not only ask me for something, not only ask for the blessing, but will go to the blesser. Will not just go for the gifts, but for the giver of the gifts. That out of the overflow of their ministry unto me, they will minister to others. Walter Butler said, if you build God a house of devotion, he will build you a house of ministry. But we can spend our whole life praying for that house of ministry when we need to focus on that house of devotion to the Lord. Entering into that friendship with God. Carrying his heart. That means he can trust you. And so you're going to be driving down the road and all of a sudden you're going to get a burden. You're going to begin to weep in your car. You're going to wake up at 3.03 in the morning and suddenly you're going to be over ridden with an intense burden of the Lord. And that means you get up, you get down on your face, and you travail in the spirit until it lifts. Once it lifts, then you're free to go back to bed. That's you carrying the burden of the Lord and praying clear through. That's intercession. Intercession is praying in the place of another. That's a very selfless way to live. Well, what's it in for me? Nothing. You just pray. Intercede. I prayed and did intercession for people that I did not even know. The Lord would speak to me and say, right now in Egypt, this is happening, pray. Right now in Africa, I desire to move in a certain village. There's a certain pastor that's there that's asking me for the fire. Would you agree with me? I'm feeling excitement in my spirit. Right now, I want you to pray. And I would pray until I felt a peace on the inside of me that I know that I prayed clear through and I fellowshiped with the Lord, not in the suffering, but in his celebration. That's a true friendship with the Lord. Will you be one that enters that kind of relationship with the Lord? Will you carry his burden? Do you carry his burden and allow him to rest? Do you carry his burden and allow him to rest? In Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 22, it speaks of the soldiers who took him into their headquarters and called out the entire battalion. They dressed him in a purple robe and made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head. Then they saluted, yelling, Hail, King of the Jews. And they beat him on the head with a stick. They spit on him and dropped to their knees to mock and worship. Verse 20. It says, and when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Verse 21. This is a verse I want you to focus on. A man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the country just then. And they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Remember that. And they brought Jesus to the place called Calgatha, which means the Skull Hill. So here's Simon, minding his own business. And Jesus, he came to an intersection where Jesus was coming on by. He saw the suffering of Jesus. At first, I think he didn't want anything to do with it. He probably didn't want to... Uh, get in the way of the Romans. He probably didn't trust the Romans. He probably didn't know if maybe they decided to crucify him too. He probably was a little nervous, but he carried the cross of Jesus. He allowed the Lord a season to rest a little bit. Now remember, Jesus was whipped 39 times, so his back was bleeding. He was sore. The cross probably dug the crown of thorns deep into his skull. He was in intense pain. As he carried the cross, he fell 
to the dirt. There were probably stones in the dirt, and his knees were busted open. He got so tired that he couldn't lift the cross anymore. But Simon of Cyrene carried his cross. Simon allowed the Lord to rest. Simon carried the burden of the Lord. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 16, verse 13, this is Paul speaking. Now remember, let's go back, that Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus, right? Romans 16, verse 13, Paul said, Greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Simon carried the burden of Jesus. He took care of God's son. And because of that sacrifice, the Lord took care of his son and his family. Greet Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. The moral of the story is, when you're there for Jesus, the Lord will be there for your family. When you carry the burden of Jesus for God's only begotten son, he will take care of your sons and daughters. Hallelujah. He keeps careful records of those that care enough to fellowship with the Lord in his suffering. He keeps careful records of the sacrifice and the sleepless nights and the travail, praying for complete strangers on the other side of the planet, wrestling with the Lord in prayer for what grieves the Lord, fellowshipping with the Lord in his sufferings, and the Lord says, because you fellowshiped with me in my sufferings, I will now fellowship with you in your sufferings, and I will be there for your sons and your daughters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I could give a full part two message on this, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go very quickly. I'm going to give you seven things real quick. How do you bear his burden? Number one, realizing that giving is a two-way street. Realize that giving is a two-way street. Not only do we cast our cares on him, but we allow him to cast his cares on us. And I know that we're limited. I know we're human beings. And how could we ever comfort the heart of God, but yet we can't dry his tears. And our attempt to even reach out our human hand to dry a tear from the cheek of Jesus, touches his heart so much, and I know that we're limited, but he's so touched by somebody who reaches out to dry his tear and minister unto him. He's so touched. Number two, know that something is on his heart. Something is on his heart. At any moment, something's on his heart. Will we be willing to listen do we care enough to ask him the question? At 21 years old, when I got out of Pinecrest, got back home, had that revelation in the basement that I never asked the Lord what was on his heart. And that revelation encouraged me to ask the question, Lord, what's on your heart? And because of that question, it opened up a full new door a friendship with the Lord that I didn't know existed. Oh, I'm giving you not only a piece of my heart today, but I'm giving you a piece of the heart of God. I promise you that your intimacy with the Lord will grow so much through this. I want to write a book on this. Thank you, Lord, I will. I'll 
dedicate it to Janae and everybody in the refuge gathering on this very day. Hallelujah. No something is on his heart. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. When he came into full view of the city, he wept out loud over it and exclaimed. He wept out loud. When you study that word wept, it means to wail. It refers to hard crying, lamentation, bewailing. Jesus wept over the city, making the prediction of its destruction. There's something on his heart right now for New York. Sometimes the message is positive and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's judgment. He's about ready to say judgment is coming to America. People don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about the judgment. But there is judgment coming. Now is our time to repent. Yes, the Lord will always have a remnant. And I believe he'll protect his remnant. Judgment's coming. He's weeping out loud for those that are ignoring him right now. And we know as time goes on, and as we approach the final end, as the seals become unsealed, and all the stuff that happens in the book of Revelation, it's not going to be easy street. We know there will be an Antichrist at some point that will come. We know all of these things. Number three, ask him what is on his heart. Ask him. How do you bear his burden? Ask him. He's such a gentleman. He stands there and he waits. Remember I said earlier today, some people he waits an entire lifespan. There are some people that were born and died at 99 years old and never once asked the Lord. They were a nice little churchgoer. They invited Jesus into their heart, but they never had friendship with him. I don't want to shortchange myself. I want to be the friend of God. So therefore I must ask. Number four, be silent and listen. Be silent and listen. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth be silent in his presence. Be silent in his presence. Sometimes we do so much talking in prayer, we don't have enough time to listen. A wise preacher once said from the south, God gave us two ears and one mouth. We should listen doubly as much as we speak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have to listen. The Lord is not going to overtalk us. We've had friends that will overtalk us. Jesus will just silently be quiet. If we interrupt and we're like, oh, Lord, speak to me. And then three seconds later, like, oh, Lord, I got this burden. <laughs> He'll just silently and sit there and go, oh, I wish I could take you deeper. I want you to be my, my deep bride. <sighs> Number five, be still. Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. If you want to get the burden of the Lord, you probably shouldn't do it while you're in the middle of the mall in the middle of Walmart. Go somewhere, be quiet, be still, be attentive. Number six, that goes into the next one. Listen with your inner ear. Your inner ear. Let him that have ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Let him that have ears to hear. We all have ears, but do we have ears to hear? Listen with your inner ear. Tune your ear to his heart. Lean up against his chest, John the Beloved. Hear his heartbeat. Tell him that you're concerned. Number seven, press in until you have breakthrough in your spirit. When you receive the burden, press in until there's breakthrough. It may feel like a wrestling match. You may feel tremendous travail. There are times that I could not even barely speak. This is the kind of groaning that Daniel Nash had with the Lord. He groaned. Abel Clary, they groaned. Groanings. The Bible talks about that. About deep groaning. Words that cannot be uttered. Something so deep on the inside of you, you just groan. 
And sometimes you'll just lay there and groan and go, oh, you'll feel the burden of the Lord. And you'll wrestle with it. Receive it and fight through it until it lifts. And then know that you have fellowship with the Lord in his sufferings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So my friends, we all have that opportunity right now to enter a brand new level of relationship with the Lord. Today, we can start by saying, Lord, it's not only going to be about me from now on, it's also going to be about you. Lord, I want to be not just one of many disciples. I don't even want to be amongst the 12, Lord. And I don't want to be just amongst the three. I want to go deeper. I want to be your John, the beloved, in this day. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your precious ones that are sitting here today and those that are watching. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that they would feel and hear that call to come unto you and that they would enter into that relationship where they fellowship with you in your suffering, where they carry your burden. Lord, I pray that those that watch today would enter spiritual growth in multiplication far beyond they've ever experienced before, that the intimacy with you would be increased and they would literally sense and feel the bleeding heart of God. And they would also sense the celebration and the dancing and the joy of the Lord, which is their strength. Father, I pray that they would enter into the fullness of your spirit. The fullness. A deep crying out to deep. Father, I pray that that deep in us would cry out to the deep in you. And the deep in you would cry out to the deep in us. It wouldn't just be us crying out deep, but that we would care enough to listen to hear the deep in you. Father, deep cries out to deep. As the noise of the water spouts. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we would enter into that relationship, that very special relationship with you. That you would gently take us by the hand into that quiet garden of the Lord. And that we would sit there with you and listen to what's on your heart. And that we would also share what's on our heart. Father, I thank you for that true giving, yet also receiving relationship that you've called us to. Lord, isn't that what true romance is all about? A giving and receiving. So Lord, bring us into that. I pray that you would bring me into that further in Jesus' name. I want to go deeper into the inner chambers of your heart. In Jesus' precious ask that you would transfer right now the burden of the Lord to your people. In Jesus' precious name. That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What John the Beloved had, you can have. Let it be. In Jesus' lunch together, then after we'll have a couple more worship songs and some closing thoughts. I want to also say that next month is going to be very special, that we're going to have a Christmas, special Christmas refuge gathering. Hallelujah. It's going to be a Christmas dinner, lunch. We're going to have some Christmas music. 
that I haven't talked to Stephanie about yet. <laughs> and a special word, a special fellowship, and some surprises planned for you. Really excited about that. And uh, so make preparations to come. Because remember, January, we will not be here. Because the first Saturday of January is right after New Year's. And so we're going to give you time to be with your family. So we won't be meeting till February. And then once we hit March, that's our first year anniversary. Can you believe it? March, our first year anniversary. And I want to have a Super Bowl kickoff celebration <laughs> anniversary. What's that? Up in Woolkin. Woolkin. Not for the refuge gathering. Our very first refuge gathering was in March. Yes, it was. Yeah. I have the videos to prove it. No, I went to the post. Yeah. Yes. Let me shut this off real quick.